many years ago. You started with a clothing store? Yeah, well, it was handicrafts, really, with a little bit of South American clothing thrown in. Because I was traveling uh, through South America and fell in love with the handicrafts in South America and decided to start importing them. And for the first year, sold them to uh, museum shops and did a few gallery exhibits. And after about a year of wandering around the Northeast doing that, I said, you know, it's time for me to settle down and open a little shop. So the first shop was called Putumayo, which was named after a region in Colombia I spent a lot of time collecting crafts in. And a uh, tiny little hole-in-the-wall shop in New York City. Um, but it was essentially handicrafts, uh, textiles, uh, 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 paintings, um, carved gourds and wood objects and stuff. And some hand-knit let's say, ponchos and other kinds of clothing that people in South America wore that Americans fancied. It was a moment when ethnic clothing was mm -hmm. becoming popular. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Guatemalan wrap skirts and, uh, you know, all of it was colorful or it was very earthy. And people liked it, so that really became the essence of what worked for Putumayo in the early years. And to create an environment back then, I would bring back records from uh, Peru, Bolivia, and play them as part of the musical mix. But years passed, and I started expanding and started traveling to Asia, India, uh, Indonesia, and um, Afghanistan, and lost touch with the musical side of Putumayo, opened more stores, and then one day I was traveling uh, back from Bali in Indonesia and, and stopped in San Francisco, heard it was, uh, oh, <laughs> was walking through Golden Gate Park and I heard this wonderful uh, African band, which, you know, I'm sure I've mentioned over the years and to you that um, there was just something special about that afternoon. I was walking through the park, I heard these sounds coming from this little opening in the woods in Golden Gate Park and there was this wonderful, colorful, lively African band. You know, they were finishing up their set, so I only heard a couple of songs, but what I heard I loved, and I saw how it had brought a lot of people of different backgrounds and ethnicity, you know, ages, ethnicities, dancing together, um, having a great time, and so it was a magical moment. Just like the moment that I, you know, when I named the company Putumayo, I was sitting, uh, I decided to do that when I was sitting by um, a stream, uh, in a, uh, kind of a tributary to the Amazon, um, Putumayo River itself is a pretty big river, but I was sitting in a little stream that flowed into the Putumayo, and I could kind of see the Andes in the background, birds were flying around, it was a gorgeous day, and the uh, indigenous people were coming back from the fields to put on their colorful costumes for what was essentially a Carnival Day celebration. And I was struck by, you know, the beauty of the place, the magic of the place, and I liked the name Putumaya, so that's how I chose the name. And then, over time, you know, got tired of uh, what evolved into a clothing business, and so when music came along, I was thrilled to kind of make that switch. I wanted to ask you about, you're talking about your ethnic store and the music, etc. You've seen the Seinfeld episode, haven't you? Quite a few times, yes. Now, were you involved in that? Or did you know about it? Or yeah. you a friend of Jerry Seinfeld? No, um, it was just a funny little coincidence because actually it aired on the day I was signing the agreement to sell the Putumayo stores. Wow. And so I had all my friends saying to me, don't sell, you're going to be on Seinfeld, it's going to be famous, you know. And I uh, was convinced, you know, I was so sick of the clothing business that I just decided to do it anyway. And actually... Um, uh, you know, when I was at one of the music conferences, by that point I had been had started a record label. Um, we had to approve the script, and so we got faxed the script, and a bunch of us were sitting around and actually playing. Like one guy who's my co-founding partner, Michael, he played Kramer because he has some Kramer-esque <laughs> qualities, and we all took turns, you know, playing the role and seeing how it sounded. And, uh, you know, but basically we sent them props and stuff. It was, uh, my understanding was that it was a writer at Seinfeld um, who had been a customer of Putumayo, and they were just obviously looking around for something to incorporate. And, uh, you know... Well, it, it was, seemed like brilliant marketing. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's not something you... I mean, I remember afterwards people contacted us. I remember... Um, 
getting a call from, we were talking with the people from Cirque du Soleil about a potential project, and they said, how do, you, how do you get on Seinfeld? Like, it's a thing that you kind of can just promote or market yourself. And I think that those guys probably do get pitched or did get pitched. Um, but it was just, it's really one of those things you realize in life that, you know, it's, these moments happen. Sure, sure. And, you know, I chuckle when I see it. And it's funny because Elaine uh -huh. will pronounce Putumayo like three or four different ways throughout the episode, <laughs> which is the way a lot of people are. They, you know, Putumayo, Putumayo, you know. But yeah, it was, it was fun. Well, you know, I'm going back even further. You were an athlete at school, right? Well, I wouldn't say that I was particularly an athlete. I was, um, I loved sports, and I played baseball in high school on the team, and I played tennis in college. And it was through that that I was able to actually earn enough money after I graduated college through teaching tennis to travel to South America and uh, begin to buy handicrafts. So you weren't ever a hippie, were you? No, it's funny. People, it, you know, people looked at me and said, oh, you must have got your start through... Um, importing drugs or something. I was like, <laughs> I was too scared to even try drugs in South America. You know, I mean, it was like, you know, I saw a lot of people doing it. I just said, that is just, you know, I was really interested in the cultures. And uh, when I went to school in Spain for a semester, uh, or I went to college and I majored in Latin American studies. But yeah, I, what, why did you pick Latin American studies? Is anybody in your family Latin American? or No, it was actually a result of a trip that I took with my aunt and uncle when I was 16 to Mexico. They invited me on a trip. My uncle was lecturing. He's a doctor lecturing in Mexico City. And they brought their family, invited me to join them on a month-long journey around Mexico. And they are the best travelers, you know. They really are responsible, I think, for getting me interested in travel and... and uh, and we had an incredible time, and I spent a month after that with my cousin working at Teotihuacan, which is the pyramid, where the pyramids are outside of Mexico City, and, you know, fell in love with uh, Mexico and Latin American crafts, and decided, really, that I wanted to major in Latin American studies. And uh, I spent a semester abroad in Spain, partly to improve my Spanish, and also... Which, which part of Spain? In Madrid. Uh-huh. And also, you know, there were some leading experts in, uh, you know, Spanish... Uh, history, which obviously ties in with Latin America. So it was an incredible, you know, that period was an incredible time. And then when I graduated, I spent the summer in, uh, teaching tennis and earning money to be able to travel to South America, and then went down there. And the first day I was in Colombia, um, I saw a guy selling uh, that beautiful hand-woven tapestry for the wall, and I mm -hmm. said... I bet they'd love it in America. I bought it, and I started um, kind of this journey, I guess you could say, of uh, traveling around South America looking for handicrafts. What kind of a, a doctor is your uncle? Endocrinologist. Okay, all right. And and so, anyway, um, obviously today, Putumayo is CDs, right? Yes. Are you musical at all? Do you well, sing? I piano, or? No, I don't sing. Uh, I sing in the shower. But I, I um, took piano lessons for many years when I was a kid. But I'm not as... Um, I never kind of felt like I could be a really good musician. But I always loved music. Mm -hmm. And even in high school, I mean, one, of, one of my best friends um, subscribed to Billboard magazine. And he had this bulletin board where he would keep track of the hits, and we would guess what's going to be the next number one hit, and, uh, you know, you chart, you know, it was just fascinating, he was very kind of scientific about it, and we would wager, you know, which one of us was picking the hits best uh, in terms of radio popularity. Well, it's funny, actually, you know, you obviously have a very natural ear for picking out a successful sound, because with all the different artists that you have from all over the world... There's something, well, there's something very distinctive about all of them. I mean, all the countries have a very distinctive sound of their own, don't they? Well, you know, I think they have distinctive sounds, and because of the increasing, you know, connection, uh, whether it's through artists touring mm -hmm. um, and playing at festivals and playing with each other, getting to know each other's music, whether it's through the Internet these days... Um, 
the sound spreads. And, you know, I'm working on an album now of Australian music. And oh, really? It will come out next year. And I was shocked when I... Re- not shocked, I guess. It's to be expected a little bit that, um, you know, global influences are there. It's not like, besides, you know, in- indigenous didgeridoo music, mm. um, there is a wealth, you know, and there's a huge blues scene in Australia. There's a huge alternative, you know, country... Uh, Americana scene, although it kind of fits in Australia. Um, many of the country music stars are coming out of Australia these days. Um, and you have, um, you know, just the world of singer-songwriter, the global singer-songwriter movement. And influence is, you know, one of the... We're also doing a kids' album, so there's a lot of, you know, there's African influences, reggae influences. You know, what happened with Bob Marley's popularity around the world you know, changed popular music in a lot of ways. Just incorporate, you know, more and more artists incorporated reggae into their uh, repertoire. There was a point in time, wasn't there, when you actually brought out CDs dedicated to just one artist? Yes. That was and then the, you stopped that. Yeah. I learned pretty quickly that that was a sure path to uh, <laughs> disaster. Um, no, actually, it was, uh, it was interesting. Um, I tell people that uh, doing compilations is like dating. You know? mm-hmm. Signing an artist is like getting married. <laughs> and when we were signing, get three or four artists signed, the amount of time I was spending, you know, as a kind of quasi manager, you know, hand holding, working on, you know, the recordings, um, you know, sometimes arguing about which songs are good enough to make it on the album, which songs are too long to really keep people's interest after a while. You know, the artists are obviously very, you know, connected to their art, and um, I just felt like this is like a marriage, and I can't remain married to these people, I can't do justice to it, and at the same time, I was disappointed because, you know, kind of the final decision was one week where we had uh, one of my favorite artists of all time, Oliver Mitchell from Zimbabwe. Mm, Yeah. Uh, We had gotten him on the Letterman show, Mm -hmm. on All Things Considered, on NPR, on fresh air in the same week, and yet we couldn't get enough albums into the stores uh, to really, through our distributor at that time, to be able to really take advantage of the investment in time and effort that we'd made. And I just said, and then I went to a concert where the sound was really bad. Mm. The sound guy had done a poor job, mm. and I just said, I, you know, it will just emotionally be too dis. dis- Disappointing. Whereas the compilations, I can pick the songs and I can work with the artist sometimes to re-record or do edits um, to the songs. I don't have to actually have the same level of investment of you know personal emotion and time and effort into it. Well, you do a lot of. Uh, I mean, just this whole organization, which is basically you. I mean, you don't have a business degree or anything, do you? No, I mean it's all kind of been. Um, Instinct? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, I always had this idea that people would love things that I liked. Yeah, that's, that's a good and, way to go about it. you know, it was just one of those things. And then I play the music for my staff, and if they like it, signs are pretty good that others would like it. I want to introduce people to other cultures yeah. through music, yeah. uh, the positive side of other cultures. So mm-hmm. the idea is that if they like a song, it's one of the reasons, actually, I'm not as interested in releasing artist albums, because I think the idea is I can introduce people to an artist or to the music of a region or a culture, and then they could go deeper. You know, so I figured that you know my best role in this will be to introduce people to great music and artists, and then you know hopefully they'll want to travel to those countries, they'll want to listen to music by the artist, whatever you know they find uh, appealing. So I, I do feel that's one of the things that we've been able to do over the years. Well, I certainly think it makes another culture appear a lot more endearing to people that might be somewhat, I don't know, I'm thinking of all your Arabic ones, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the music's so beautiful, and of course, Arabic people are normally extremely friendly, mm-hmm. but they're getting a very bad rap at the moment, so, you know, it's nice to have all this. Zain al-Jundi, you know who yeah. she is, of course, she was saying to me that she was absolutely mesmerized by the amount of detail that you put into those compilations, you know, she said, gosh, I mean, don't think these are just, you know, 13 artists, she said, it's, he agonizes over this, is that right? Well, it's funny because, um, 
I think I drove her crazy at one point because she was helping write the liner notes. And, you know, it's not just the work that goes into picking the songs. Then there's the sequencing. Sure. And, you know, I think she was part of that process. And, you know, she made many recommendations for one of the Arabic albums. And she could see how, you know, it, you know, had to run the gauntlet in a way of, of my ears, through my staff's ears here. You have a European office, so they weigh in. It's got to make it through that whole process. And then, a lot of times, artists will record a song that's four or five, six, seven minutes long, and we feel it just doesn't sustain the interest, so we'll ask for approval to edit. Then we have the liner notes, generally written by Jacob Edgar, who has been yeah. working with us on A&R for many years. What, he's doing, what, what, what label is he doing? Kumbancha. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, he continues to travel and research music and help you know find music for Putumayo and curate. I mean, uh, you know, put together, we have a database of about 40,000 songs. Um, the way it's been, you know, recently divided is that my focus particularly has been um, kind of American roots music, partly since I've moved to New Orleans. Um, and so everything from jazz, blues, etc. Um, to kids music. Mm. And Jacob has, you know, because of his background in ethnomusicology and his love, he's helped find a lot of the African, Middle Eastern, uh, songs. I'm, I'm also very interested in European, French, you know, music. So we kind of, uh, we don't divide it up that way, but exactly, but we both specialize in researching certain types of music. And then at the end, I make the final decisions about what's going to be on it. And then I do the sequencing, which could be, you know, I don't know where I'm up to right now in one album, but I think I'm up to sequence number 65 and I'm still not quite satisfied. So, <clears throat> how do you find your artists? Did they come to you now? Well, it's a it's a whole array of ways. I mean, you know, now that we have themes and we say, okay, we're going to work on an Australia collection, it's a little bit, you know, you, you, you've got what you've got, we've got what we've got in the database, and then we start looking around for more Australian artists. We have a small office in Australia, so... We in Sydney? Uh, no, actually outside of Adelaide. Mm -hmm. They're now our distributor. They've become independent, but basically they were working for us, with us, for several years. And, you know, they've made recommendations. Um, when I traveled to Australia, I got, I asked around and got a lot of suggestions. Jacob, as well, was in Australia um, for, um, uh, I think, a music conference. So he got a lot of music and suggestions. And... Through that process, we whittle it down, and sometimes we're shocked, you know, that it's not as easy to come up with a dozen good songs that flow together. I was just listening last night to the Australia sequence, and I'm just going, it's close, but just not quite there, you know, I need one or two other songs, I need to, you know, so the, guy, the idea is to really, for Putumayo to take you on a musical journey that is interesting and guaranteed to make you feel good, and that it flows from beginning to end. And getting there, you know, for me, is part of the fun and, and the journey and the challenge. Well, you know, speaking of music of Australia, it's something that I find particularly hard when I'm putting a, an Australian show together. Well, I'd never do Australia on its own because I don't have enough material. Right. And I don't want Australian artists that sound like American artists. What's the point, you right. know? So I, that, that defeats me all the time. Why, if you come from Sweden, do you want to sound like somebody from Tennessee? Sound like someone from Sweden, for my purposes. Right. So in Australia, I find that it's either um, really hooky, waltzing Matilda type, yeah. or Aboriginal music. Yeah. I've, I find very little in between. Is there a lot? Well, I think that's the, you know, the, the interesting thing is what I said before, is the influence of uh, other music on Australia, so, um, and it may sound strange to people, because, you know, Putumayo is not about trying to be a, an encyclopedia right. of Australian music, or, yeah, you know, or that, like, we have to reference every, you know, include something from every style, um, you know, we can be eclectic in our selections, and we often are, but it all has to hang together. So, the Aboriginal music scene, I'm also working on a Native American album and an Andean album, Mm -hmm. So, Native American album, if you 
obviously know there's a yes. tremendous amount of flute music, there's chanting, there's drumming, mm-hmm. but there's also, and that's what in a way interests me more, is the singer-songwriter movement, mm-hmm. you know, so in, especially in Canada, oh, yes. there's been a strong movement <coughs> of, of kind of na- people of, of Native uh, Indigenous background, you know, writing and singing songs in their uh, tribal dialects or languages, and... Uh, so with Australia, I think our album is going to break down with, you know, more like, you know, I'd say if there are a dozen songs, five are going to have some Aboriginal connection, and seven will be a mix of contemporary music that has, in some cases, it has um, global influences like reggae or blues or other kinds of feeling, but it's, you know, oftentimes the songs themselves have some connection to Australia. You know... All this leads me to think, have you thought about having a tour company? Hmm. We've certainly talked about it over the years. We worked with some travel uh, companies and uh, haven't ended up doing it ourselves. Jacob is actually just finishing up a you know, tour. We connected him with um, a Lindblad Explorer, which has become National Geographic Explorer, and they do these cruises, and he's now led uh, three musical cruises, two to Africa, one to Latin America, Um, and they're, you know, fascinating. I joke that he, when he worked at Putumaya full-time, you know, he had the best job at Putumaya because all he was doing was traveling around listening to music. (laughs) I had to run a company and deal with the day-to-day stuff, Um, and now that he runs his own company, he's gotten a chance. He started a a TV show called Music Voyager. It's It's on PBS, yeah. And he um, has been leading these tours. So I still think, you know, he's found a way to kind of continue that. And it's benefited us because he travels and can collect music. And, uh, you know, I have an eight-year-old son and live in probably what I consider to be one of the best musical cities in the world, New Orleans. So I'm not complaining. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> you're talking about music from America. Have you ever done a, I don't believe you have, music from Appalachia. Well, not per se Appalachia, but we did a bluegrass collection uh, a year That's or two right. ago. And that actually, you know, it, everyone asked us to do it at the time that Oh Brother Where Art There came out. But it yes. was so overdone. So many people were doing these albums, collections. It just didn't seem right. And I've always loved um, country and roots music. Um, and so bluegrass seemed like a natural, and we finally put one out. Yeah. <clears throat> and we did an album earlier this year in, in, in June called Acoustic America. Yeah, I heard that one. Which has a fair amount of, you know, different types of American roots music. And I received an album recently from you. Um, I think it was Cafe Latino, was it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you put out so many CDs. And, of course, everybody comments on the cover art. Nicola Hendel? Yes. I mean, it's just beautiful. So, which is leading me up to... And I get very frustrated now with um, MP3s just being sent. No CD, the MP3, you know? And I'm like, oh, man, (laughs) this is work. This is not putting it on and listening and looking at the notes and enjoying it. This is, you know, you've got to put some effort into it. Yeah, I feel the same way. I can't listen. You know, people will often want to send me stuff Uh on MP3. I'm like... No, don't bother. (laughs) <laughs> no, and the funny thing is, I mean, I, we, we reluctantly, you know, began offering when we could through, li- you know, because of licensing issues, newer releases through um, iTunes, through MP3s, and um, you know, I do find though that the quality of the sound is not the same, mm-hmm. and the experience isn't the same. The liner notes do mean something. The experience of being able to, you know, listen in your car and you know in uh you know just different settings also feels just more relaxing it does and i after tw- eight to 12 hours a day on my computer you know or you know listening talking to people on my phone you know the last thing i want to do is sit there and actually stare at a computer screen yeah yeah well as i say i i loathe those mp3s i really do and i'm i tend to actually not play them so much because i can't be bothered 
you know, searching them out and putting... I make CDs out of them, but then yeah. I'm missing the liner notes and the colour and all that sort yeah. of thing. And the little recipes at the back. <laughs> Whose idea was that, by the way? Well, you know, I always felt it was not just about the music. It's, it's a, whole, a whole experience, right? Well, we want people to learn a little bit about the culture. So, you know, food is a big part of every cultural experience. You know, if you're traveling, you're... You know, you're you're gonna seek out hopefully, you know, good food from the local area, and so we thought recipes would be a good thing. And in fact, we're you know, as we're going back, some of the albums we didn't, you know, focus on getting recipes for, right. we're adding them in. And uh, I think there are now 18 albums that have recipes in them. Um, we generally, when possible, on the kids one especially, we'll always have things like glossaries, give people a little more background about the instruments about the culture itself um, because I do feel you know that I want people to experience a little bit and learn a little bit about the culture as they listen to the music see I love your kids albums I actually find it hard to differentiate between kids and adults you know to me they're all great but I think the kids albums have just I mean they've got rhythm and they're very upbeat I suppose that's maybe maybe mind you all all your artists are pretty upbeat aren't they well, I think it's the songs that we select yeah. are based on this idea. The slogan that Putumayo has had since the beginning is guaranteed to make you feel good. And the basic premise has always been that, you know, I guess you could say, you know, we, we, much of the music that we, that we pick comes from places, you know, like Haiti or parts of Africa that struggle from crime, mm. disease all kinds of, you know, economic issues. At the end of the day, you know, people who struggle often will find ways to rise above those struggles to be, at least find some semblance of happiness and music and dance and food are among the ways people can enjoy life. And so, you know, if they pick songs that'll enable, if we pick songs that are melodic and upbeat and as we say, guaranteed to make you feel good, then hopefully Putumayo is kind of presenting the better side of um, kind of the cultures that's, you know, that, that often are depicted in the news with nothing but problems, you know. Have you done anything from Russia? We've included Russian songs. Um, there is a long history of, you know, some countries, regions, you know, either we haven't traveled there to look for music or we're not really sent much. Russia is one of those places. For some reason, we you know we brought a Russian artist uh, to America, part of a project called One World that we did in 1996, and we played. Uh, we did a kind of tour with her and a couple of other groups. We went down to did a concert at the Washington Monument. We went to Atlanta for the Olympics and played at the you know for the Olympic uh, athletes in Atlanta. Um, but you know, reality is that. We're just not getting much music sent from there, and, and much of Asia as well. I mean, we're certainly long, you know, we're working on a couple of Asian projects for next year, uh, but it's, you know, surprising sometimes how little music, relatively speaking, we've received. And, and uh, you know, you have to oftentimes recognize that the local cultures have migrated into the world of popular music. So a lot of it is, you know, Hip hop, um, you know, homogenized pop music, which mm. isn't really what we're after. No, I understand. Tell me, how many people do you have working in this office? Um, I think there are about eighteen people in this office. Really? And and do they all travel? Are they based in New York? Well, we have three smallish offices here in the states. The main office here in New York, the small office I work out of when I'm in New Orleans. And then a kind of warehouse shipping small office in outside of Nashville, Tennessee. The only and, and Vermont, actually where Jacob is. So we have a, an A and R coordinator assistant who works with Jacob and me on researching music. Um, and so, you know, I go between these places, Jacob travels, and we have salespeople who work with, you know, everything from um, you know, gift stores, bookstores, museum Museums. shops. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of our main focuses has been trying to kind of find ways to introduce Americans 
to music through kind of non-traditional ways. Sure, sure. You don't take like, advertisements on television or anything like that, do you? No, I mean, we, we uh, actually did many years ago try it, and it proved, you know, not very successful. Um, you know, we recognized that, you know, it's, it, it's not automatically mainstream music. We may sell hundreds of thousands of certain CDs because people may love, you know, we did an album called from Vintage France that came out this year that people yeah. seem to really like. Heard it, yeah. And French Cafe and Paris, these albums have sold continuously over the years. Um, French music's very appreciated, um, but it's just not, the, it's not mainstream. And so the idea is, you know, these non-traditional retailers give us a chance to play the music overhead. Places like Whole Foods or 10,000 Village Fair Trade retailers. Yeah, I think that's probably the way I've actually in, been introduced to a lot of foreign artists. Is just listening, walking through a store yeah. and listening to something playing in the background and, oh, what's that? You know? Well, I remember the first time I had a friend who had a store in uh, Portland, Maine. And I'll remember, I remember the first time I heard Enya's Orinoco Flow. Oh, I know, we all remember and, that. Uh, the first time I heard Tracy Chapman, yeah. you know, that uh -huh. voice coming out of the speaker, like, <laughs> whoa, what is that? And that's part of what you want, I think. Um, you know, and I, again, I recognize these days that there's so much music out there, and that I, in a way, I think what Putama is trying to do is kind of curate from this ocean of music to find a way to get people to connect because it is overwhelming. And, you know, the guarantee is that if you don't love it, you can always send it back to us and we'll refund your money. You know, the bottom line is it's worth trying. It's worth it. You know, whether you buy it on a CD where, you know, we know that, believe the sound is stronger and the experience will be more complete, or you do buy it as an MP3, it will be a way in which you can kind of discover um, an artist, a, a sound, a genre of music, a country. Mm -hmm. Well, you've been enormously successful in what you do. I mean, uh, and the one thing about the Pudu Mayo compilations is you can listen to it from beginning to end. You don't have to pick particular tracks out. There are other compilation CDs where you might like two or three of the tracks, you know, and the others, like, they, they, they don't even flow together. They are just a collection of tracks put together in a very, to my mind, sloppy fashion with, you know, music of Asia. <laughs> and that, uh, you can tell that there's been a lot of effort and thought put into those okay. Putumayo CDs. It shows they're wonderful, really Thank you. wonderful. Well, you know, I, I, I greatly appreciate hearing that from people who have listened to a lot of music. Yeah. You know, and I recognize that, um, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, you think like, you know, you're in this world where you're separated from people. So the feedback, you know, I think people assume that I'm always getting calls or emails. Or, you know, I mean, oftentimes it takes for me to go out and visit retailers or go out in the field for me to hear from people. And, uh, you know, you recognize how much, you know, people have appreciated the efforts over the years. And I think, um, you know, it's our 20th anniversary year. Mm -hmm. So I, I look back and go, holy, <laughs> holy moly. This how did this 20 happen? Years, yeah. yeah, how did 20 years go by? And... Yet, yeah, and how did we, put, you know, put together almost 200, I don't know, in the neighborhood of 200 collections? Um, but the funny thing is, there's still so much more to explore. Sure. And I'm sitting there, and one of my great frustrations is, you know, you can only put out a finite number of albums a year, or it's overwhelming. Um, and it takes a lot of time and effort and money to do it. So to do it well, you want to do it right. And, you know, quality versus quantity, um, quality is more important. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, it, it, I mean, at least you now have a very recognisable name and people know they're going to get something really good, you know. I had a friend, a young man, he was a pop star, a would-be pop star, and everything seemed to be going right. I mean, he had all the right connections. Madonna was the person, you know, pushing him and he was going on tours and whatever. He was going to be released at Walmart, Target, mm -hmm. his photograph everywhere, his voice booming, you know. And it all just whoop, fizzled out. He's now an environmental engineer. But, <laughs> I mean, the amount of effort and money that went into promoting him yeah. was astonishing. Yeah. I mean, really well, astonishing. Well, I think that's the whole premise, the historical major label approach in the old days, because it did cost money to really promote an artist, is that, you know, maybe you'd release 10 albums and one or two um, 
would be successful enough to justify the you know fact that the others were not you know so I think um, you know the ability these days because of the internet um, and some of the other you know factors economically decline in, in, in the number of record stores and outlets yeah, that sell yeah, music. Yeah, that's the other thing as well. You know, the reality is that there aren't as many opportunities to promote yourself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the breakthroughs, you know, are always few and far between. And when they happen, it's always astonishing. It's just for world music, especially, um, and roots music, there's been this growing interest over the years. And I think the fact mm -hmm. is that the interest and the curiosity and the appeal is there, but I think because of the nature of the economy and, and general, you know, decline of the record industry uh, and record outlets, um, there just isn't as much opportunity to listen in a focused way. So a lot of times people may hear something, I mean, NPR has been very important oh, yes. in a public radio because of shows like yours, mm -hmm. um, community radio. But there's also, you know, the fact that, you know, you might hear something once, you never catch the name of the artist. That's right. Mm -hmm. You don't think, hey, I'm going to call the station or check their website. You don't do it, and you don't hear it again, and that moment is gone. In the old days, you could oftentimes, and I remember when people like Cesaria Evera, um, you know, I mean, some groups have become successful, like Pink Martini and others, partly because they're able to tour. Yes. And then, yes. you know, there is an element that is enough radio-friendly mm -hmm. that they basically um, get exposure and have a successful career. But those artists, you know, that can be like that, Bivel Gilberto and others, you know, are, are few and far between. Mm -hmm. uh, I met what, Rupa and the April Fishers. Oh, cool. She's at Convention. Yeah, yes, she came did. to our house one time. And Which I love her, yeah. She's, and, she's fabulous. And she's a doctor. Well, she's an example, uh, you know, a good example of how we worked with Kumbancha, the record label that Jacob started. Um, but, you know, radio, uh, Rosalie Howarth, who is my co-host, um, although I haven't recorded myself several years now, um, radio shows, uh, I have a syndicated radio show as well. Yes. And Rosalie um, sent me uh, an email saying, you know, You're, you'd really like this group, group in the April Hit Fishes, uh, they're uh -huh. based in the Bay Area. Um, got the CD, loved it, passed it along to Jacob. Jacob loved it, signed them, and yeah, yeah. then released. Oh, she is. She's astonishing, that woman. She really is. Half the year she works as an internal physician, internal medicine physician. The yeah. other half she's out touring. Yeah. Oh, it's she's amazing great. Amazing to try and balance that career. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's got the best of both worlds. Yeah. That's what she said. I can't be a good doctor if I can't be a musician. I can't be a great musician if I'm not a good doctor. Right. You know, cool. so anyway, last night um, I'm, I'm not going to keep you any longer because I know you're busy. But last night we were in a taxi with um, a tambourine flute playing driver here uh, in the United, in, in New York, and man, I, he he was okay. But I mean, I would prefer to have his hands on the wheel and rather than playing the flute as he was driving along. It was just. <laughs> wow, that's a, very, that's a New York scene. So then New he York produced country. this tambourine, which he began to play as well, and <laughs> completely oblivious to all that was going on around us. Yeah. Wow. So that was something wow. else. I think, where, I don't know, where he came from? Where did he come from? The Middle East? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He was from Afghanistan, obviously very much missing his culture. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I... Um, I have these moments around the world when I travel where, you know, it could be a taxi driver, it could be another where I'll discover music. A Haitian uh, driver might be playing something. There's a big Haitian community in New Orleans. And they'll be playing something that, you know, they happen to have a cassette or something from Haiti. or And I'll discover artists that way. Um, music. Afghanistan is an interesting one because I went there three times. And I still, I, I don't know that we've ever included a song by an Afghani artist. It's, it was not music that either made it out of Afghanistan, it was not as universal, but there's been um, a growing interest in music in the post-Taliban era, and um, and the instruments themselves are fascinating, and it just reminded me that, you know, one of my favorite museums is the San Antonio Museum of Art. Oh, yes. Um, where, which has an incredible, and that Rockefeller donated a big mm -hmm. South American, Latin American art collection, and, you know, as I travel... Um, you know, there's this incredible um, 
music museum in, in Scottsdale, Arizona, outside of Phoenix, with instruments like the ones you're talking about on, mm-hmm. that the taxi driver played. So there is this world, you know, you don't realize every community has people who play music from their, their local own country. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so it is the big cross fertilization time as people travel, as it's always been, you know, through Camel Caravan, from sure. Camel Caravan. The days. Silk, silk, silk Roof. Silk Roof. Yeah. yeah. I know the Rough Guide uh, compilations, they did one on Afghanistan. And uh, again, very disparate artists. You know, what I mean, <laughs> nothing, nothing fits. It's just like, oh, what's this one? But well, uh, I think it's you know, I think that's part of the difference, I guess, between the way Putumayo um, puts its collections together. The focus is on not just the songs, but also the way that you the, know, flow. the flow. And you know, I've always felt like people, you know, they laugh at me because sometimes they say your albums are short, mm-hmm. and I say. You know, you should, I, I should earn more money for the songs I eliminate <laughs> by listening to thousands of songs so that you don't have to skip over those songs. <laughs> the idea is to try and have 12 songs that really flow and that you're going to enjoy every one. Maybe not as much as you, know, you might have your favorites, but the hope is that you're willing, you're not going to be skipping over or skipping around too much. Oh, you're so right. I mean, and even my little program, you know, my world music program, that's what I keep saying to you. don't know how much awful music I have to listen to. Yeah. You know, it's not just a matter of putting the good stuff on. It's all the awful stuff you listen to, and it takes me hours and hours. Well, that's uh, Jacob jokes with me about this because he gets to listen to a lot of stuff first, so I don't have to listen to it. Yeah, all. you're lucky. Yeah, uh, I, he, yeah, yeah, you've got a filter of some sort. Well, for a lot of the music, I mean, as I said, I kind of do a lot of my own music. Christmas music is one of my specialties, so uh-huh. uh, just, I don't know how I got into it, but, you know, I'm just... There's constantly. a New Orleans, didn't you do a New Orleans Christmas? Was there one, something like that? Well, we, yeah, we did a New Orleans Christmas, Jazz and Blues Christmas, mm-hmm. originally Christmas Around the World. This year we have Acoustic Christmas. Oh, good. And a new album called uh, Jewish Celebration which is just coming out now. And that's another one where there's a ton of, well, I don't say a ton, but a lot of Jewish music. But, you know, another, there aren't as many great songs as you'd like sometimes to, to choose from. Then there's uh, Idan Reichel. Yes. I mean, he's, that's but, another kombancha, yeah. and he's just, oh, well, awesome. Another one that, you know, we, uh, we found, uh, a woman just told me about an Israeli. He said, have you heard Idan Reichel? And I said, you know, and I checked him out, and we ultimately included him on an album. Yeah. And then Jacob fell in love with his music. No, he's got a chord to six. Got, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. No, he's great. Well, thank you. This has well, been fun. <laughs> I'm glad you found a way here to our offices. Well, I can see that people are filtering in. I guess it's t- t- time to start the work day, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Uh, I was started at 7 this morning, so I, don't, I feel like I'm halfway through it. <laughs> Dan, thank you so much. Thanks, Deirdre.